If you think Joe Biden is doing an excellent job, then today's show is not for you because I have a special guest from the Wall Street Journal that is going to be helping me go through some of the things that uh, are not exactly leading America down the path that citizens think is good. Over 70% of the country believes we're heading in the wrong direction. And today's guest couldn't agree more. Kim, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Hi, it's so great to be here, Stephen. Hi. So uh, Kimberly Strassel uh, is an author. She's a conservative columnist. She sits on the Wall Street Journal's editorial board. She's covered many incredible stories, including the Russia collusion hoax uh, perpetrated by the Clintons and the Democrat Party. Former President Donald Trump has publicly said she deserves the Pulitzer Prize for her writing. And so I, I wanted her to come on and go through some stories. Uh, Kim, the first one I want to hit is just today, Senator Tommy Tuberville of Alabama proved that Joe Biden is allowing illegal immigrants to be treated in our uh, veteran VA hospital system before veterans. Now, why do you think he cares so much about illegal immigrants, uh, e even more than our veterans that served our nation, gave their life, maybe a limb? Why, why are these people getting special treatment uh, before our veterans? Well, I think you're very kind to say, why does he care? I'm not sure he is involved in the answers to some of these questions. Um, I think uh, Joe Biden, for better or worse, if you look at his long history, he has long just been a vessel of wherever his party is at the moment. Wherever the re prevailing center of gravity is, that's where Joe Biden is. Um, it got him sideways when he was running for the nomination because people could look back at the at the views of the Democratic Party from 20, 30 years ago when he was there and say he was out of touch. But now he has fully embraced the progressive view. Progressives uh, tell him what to do. They are all for open borders. And their mentality is, is that those who come over, uh, even though they are not citizens, even though they are illegal, they should be entitled to everything this country has, including all of these, this country's benefits, which they would love to see vastly expanded. So that's their attitude. And that's Joe Biden's. Yeah, interesting. So if the Democrat wind is blowing, he's got to sail out ready to just go wherever it takes him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's always been that way. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Uh, now, you originally grew up in Oregon, uh, if the Internet is right. Uh, <laughs> they, they've they been trying to remove Donald Trump from the ballot. And uh, their reasoning was, we don't care whether he's guilty of insurrection or not. We just don't like him. So we want to remove him. Uh, do you think these uh, unconstitutional moves of trying to remove such a popular figure from the presidential ballot, whether it's Colorado, Oregon, Maine, or elsewhere. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that big story? It's absolutely dreadful. It is toxic for the body politic. Um, you know, uh, Colorado, you can look at that decision that came out of their court and understand the very weak legal reasoning. They at least attempted to tether it, though, uh, to an amendment in the Constitution. Maine, similarly, Oregon is showing the outer reaches when you go down this road, because as much as that court tried to pretend this was about legal grounds, this is being uh, motivated by partisan animus. All right. And the reason this is bad is because and I like to tell this to people and anyone, even those who don't like Donald Trump, is that if it can happen to one party and we go down that road, I guarantee you it will happen to another. I have covered politics now for 30 years. And the only thing that is constant in Washington is if one party puts a bar low, the other party will attempt to make it even lower. Um, and, you know, we're seeing that right now. Nancy Pelosi stripped Republicans of their committee assignments. Republicans have now done the same to Democrats. You know, we got rid of the filibuster only for lower court judges. Now it's appellate court judges. Now it's Supreme Court judges. Now Democrats say they want to get rid of the filibuster altogether. These are the things that are scary. And when you go down the road of attempting to rob people from their right to compete in elections and steal away from the electorate their ability to render their own judgment, um, you are no longer living in an operating democratic society. And so this is dangerous. I'm extremely hopeful the Supreme Court understands the danger and comes out with a 9-0 ruling against what's going on in Colorado and Maine. I don't think it's enough to have a split court. We need them to together say, knock it off, folks. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with you. 
Um, Bill O'Reilly said today that Michelle Obama is the only Democrat in America that can beat Donald Trump. You think there's any truth to that? And is the Democrat Party going to pressure her to jump in at the convention this summer? You know, unfortunately, I don't think there's truth to that. OK, if you look at uh, Donald Trump and look, he just won uh, convincingly in Iowa, convincingly in New Hampshire. But you see a lot of the vulnerabilities there, too, especially among independent voters. And let's be clear about what happened in 2020. He got only about 90 percent of Republican voters to come out and vote for him. He lost some of his own party and he lost a significant number of independents. I am very concerned. I take the other view. I think if they were to jettison Joe Biden, that Donald Trump would have a real race on his hands, no matter who came along. I think it could be even more problematic if it were Michelle Obama, although I am a skeptic of that entire idea. Uh, it takes a lot of a lot of work and a lot of organization and a lot of ground team effort to stand up a presidential a bit. And there is simply no indication that any of that has happened so far when it comes to Michelle Obama. Yeah. Well, and, and she's even said, if you follow her closely, she said, listen, I'm shy. I don't enjoy the political spotlight. Um, I'm an older woman. I'm going through menopause. I, like, I'm, I, I'm just going through a different phase in my life than running a country and the stress of running a country. So I, I don't, I'm, a, I'm the same way. I don't jump on the bandwagon that she's about to run, but maybe it gets clicks. Um, or, or maybe, you know, O'Reilly's just thinking, okay, Obama wants a third or fourth term. Um, he could run the, the country from behind the scenes. She's out front, he's behind, I don't know. But uh, it, it seems to be a, a hypothesis that many people are putting forward over and over again. Yeah, well, one more thing I'll just add to this is I think the other thing that pushes against it is I truly believe that the American public, and this was shown in 2016, is getting a little bit tired of legacy political families. Um, you know, whether it's the Bushes, whether it's the Clintons, um, we've just had a lot of repeats of the same family names. And I, I think that America is sitting there saying, you know, we're a country of more than 300 million people. Could we maybe come up with somebody new to run for president. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've had that. I've had those similar thoughts, I'm sure. In fact, uh, if you're watching this, let me know in the comments down below. Are you ready to be done with some of these dynasty families, these legacy families? I would love to hear from you. Um, OK, uh, another thing that I wanted to get your thoughts on is former Attorney General Ed Meese, uh, who served under Ronald Reagan, has just recently filed an amicus brief uh, with the Supreme Court and a couple of federal courts uh, stating uh, and, and backing it with legal rulings that uh, Special Prosecutor Jack Smith was illegally and unconstitutionally assigned by Merrick Garland to harass a presidential candidate. He says only Congress had the uh, authority to put somebody like Jack Smith in place. Do you, do you ever see this Jack Smith situation being dissolved with the, the courts leaning towards uh, an Ed Meese theory? Um, or do you see them going uh, full steam ahead, trying to jail Donald Trump for 700 plus years? So I am so glad you have brought this up. I think there's two issues to talk about here in terms of the court and the special counsel. The one is this really fascinating question that's been raised by Ed Meese. I've actually talked to other lawyers who've made a very compelling case for it. The argument being that the regulations within the Department of Justice uh, re require, if you are going to have a sort of special counsel, to have one that's already employed by the Department of Justice. You cannot bring them out because, in essence, you need some sort of Senate confirmation, um, an agreement that the person who is engaging on behalf of the government is acceptable to uh, the congressional branch. Uh, to do that. So I think that's a really fascinating question because, you know, we've had this before, the independent counsel law, and there were issues about that as well, too. So I, I hope that that may actually come to a head. But I also wonder if there isn't going to be some real curtailment of Jack Smith's powers, regardless of whether, if he, even if he's allowed to stay, um, given the number of cases that are now being presented to the Supreme Court on different issues about his ability. You know, there's this fascinating dissent that just came out of the D.C. Circuit. Um, uh, well, it wasn't a dissent. It was a statement. Essentially, the D.C. Circuit uh, uh, as a whole and bank refused to hear an appeal from Twitter 
about uh, uh, Jack Smith having demanded Donald Trump's uh, account information from Twitter without notifying Donald Trump. And there was a statement from the conservatives on the D.C. court disagreeing with this decision, refusing to take the appeal, saying this is unprecedented that we have a special counsel who can go in and snatch a president's records and then the courts don't even give the former executive, the president of the United States, a chance to litigate the questions of executive privilege. So it's just one example. I think that there's a, a number of things that are going to come up in front of the court that could put a little bit of a vice, uh, which we need around special counsels and their powers. Yeah, oh, thank you for that. Um, I have uh, a guest that comes on pretty regularly, Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer. And he told me privately months ago, um, just so you know, down the road, former Attorney General Ed Meese, he's going to come forward uh, he, I guess they had been meeting with a, a small group of people building these uh, legal defenses showing. And, and so I, I was I like kind of privy to this coming out. But boom, all of a sudden now it's come out. And I'm like, wow, that, that's crazy that, that behind the scenes, you just never know what people are working on for for good or bad. So we'll we'll have to keep people updated on on where we go there. Um uh, another thing that I wanted to get your your thoughts on is um, a lot of people are blaming Biden uh, for the uh, the strengthening of Iran by removing uh, certain groups from terrorist lists, from removing sanctions that allowed a four hundred billion dollar oil contract between China and Iran. Uh, hostage negotiations, six Americans for, or five, five or six Americans for $6 billion in unfrozen assets. Suddenly the idea of that money coming and then all of the sudden um, over in Palestine, they start attacking Israel. What, what role did the Biden administration play in strengthening Iran? Because now, I mean, we're, we're basically in a mini war in the Red Sea and, and over in the Middle East. Yeah, it's been a disaster, just an outright disaster. I mean, let's let's look at this. No one misunderstood when Joe Biden took office who some of the bad guys were out in the world, right? Uh, we had Russia, we had uh, uh, North Korea, we had Iran. I mean, and Iran's growing influence in the region has not just been this side note, but the central concern for the other regional players. It's one of the reasons... You saw the Abraham Accords under Donald Trump because you had countries like Saudi Arabia very much concerned about Iran and its backing of all of these militant groups, whether the Houthis, whether Hezbollah, whether Hamas, um, also militias in Iraq and Syria. And so nobody should misunderstand. Nobody could have misunderstood when Biden came in. Number one problem, one of the number one problems, certainly the regional problem, Iran. And yet so much interest in reversing what Donald Trump did and returning to the Barack Obama Iran nuclear deal, which was bad in its own right, which is why we started to undo it, that all they have cared about is coddling Iran trying to keep those negotiations going. Never mind that not only is that emboldened Iran to continue funding and ramping up attacks in the region, but it's emboldened our other enemies around the world. Um, uh, and you know it's required us to turn a blind eye to alliances Iran is making with Russia, uh, helping Russia in its war against Ukraine. Um, it's giving China more chances to make inroads. So this has been debilitating and destabilizing uh, within the region, but far outside the region too. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I, I've hated reporting on it. Um, you know, the attacks, the the deaths, uh, all of it is, is. I mean, it's taxing on a human to to cover the the gory side of of humanity. But um, you know, people are are curious and and want to know. But as I've you know pulled at different strings and tried to unravel, the, it all goes back to some of these uh, Biden administration uh removals and and uh, strengthening and so thank you for for uh you know helping me better understand that you you've got a new book out uh the biden malaise I, I love that uh great great title how america bounces back from joe biden's dismal repeat of the jimmy carter years um you know as as i go through here you have such great detail and story and insight on some of the, you know, let's just call them a dozen big areas that are fundamentally shifting the country. 
Uh, as you uh, researched and wrote this book, what were maybe one or two of, of the Biden issues that stood out most to you that you could share with the audience? Sure. Um, I think there's a couple. Just one thing that I, I think, though, the, the sort of fun part of this book, by the way, is that uh, it is a comparison between Jimmy Carter and Joe Biden. But the book is fundamentally making the case that that is a comparison that is fundamentally unfair to Jimmy Carter. Yeah. <laughs> because Joe Biden is just so much worse, not only because Jimmy Carter inherited a worse situation, um, but also because uh, Joe Biden, unlike Jimmy Carter, knew what to do to make things better, knew how to keep an economy, knew what mistakes not to make. Because guess who was there watching Jimmy Carter make the mistakes? Joe Biden was already in the Senate at the time. Yeah. So he knew better. And, you know, we've since had the the Laffer, uh, the Laffer curve, Milton Friedman economics, we understand the mistakes we made in the 70s. Uh, so a couple of the main areas, obviously, one is spending, um, which has had an absolutely devastating effect on inflation. And what I am now concerned is more maybe chronic long term inflation. The Fed has made some steps in reining this in. By the way, this was also partly the Fed's fault. Easy money for too long. Um, but, you know, Joe Biden, we all understand that Keynesian economics isn't the fix to anything. And by the time Joe Biden took office, the COVID emergency was over. Vaccines were going out the door. The strong fundamentals of the economy were coming back. We'd already blown way too many dollars out the door with those five prior spending bills. And yet he used that emergency that he made up a crisis as an excuse to then spend trillions of dollars more, which is a fundamental reason for the inflation that people are seeing today, why it is so painful to go to the grocery store. So, you know, unlike Jimmy Carter also inherited high inflation, he spent a little bit too much, but he actually was a bit of a tightwad <laughs> and, and he actually stopped his, his party from spending more. So that's one. The other big one I would mention is energy. Um, when Jimmy Carter got into office, uh, you know, we'd been through an oil shock. We were about to go through another one, a global oil shock. And this country at that time had not had its fracking revolution. We had very little domestic energy to speak of. Jimmy Carter, even though he's remembered for all these kind of dumb things he did in energy, solar panels on the White House and all of that stuff, he would have killed to have had a domestic energy industry. And he would have used it for all it was worth. He was an all of an above guy. He loved drilling. He loved the coal industry. He just wanted the country to have more energy. Um, compare that to Joe Biden. He inherits a country that a year before he took office had become for the first time in its history a net exporter of oil. Um, this amazing industry. Uh, we've set up all kinds of, of new opportunities as well in Anwar, offshore. He comes and shuts it all down on the first day, shuts down Keystone Pipeline. Um, uh, and then everything he's done since then, whether it's aimed at taking away your gas stove or removing your ability to get a car that doesn't have an electric engine, it's all being done again to the tune of progressives. And it's needless it's not saving the climate. It's not doing anything uh, to help us. But it's been a phenomenal part, not just of the higher energy prices everyone's been coping with, but the lack of choices and the nasty kind of new nanny state that now exists trying to dictate every ast every last aspect of your life. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's been it's been crazy, and you know, like all all these American car companies, they're like, okay, I get, I guess this is the future. And they, they shift all these billions of dollars over. They lay off all these people. They move plants to Mexico and, and elsewhere. And then now they're coming out going, oh my gosh, we're going to go bankrupt. Whoops. <laughs> people can't afford these cars. They, they, they have longevity issues. They have battery issues. So, you know, maybe we're heading that direction, but to force it so quickly on the American people, especially after a pandemic, and trying to financially recover, and then dealing with inflation that they're telling us, oh, it's seven or eight percent. Meanwhile, the dollar store jumps twenty five percent. Like the the people could feel it in their wallets, and so I feel like this upcoming election is going to be a wallet issue and a yes. safety issue. Um, the the one thing that shocked me that came out of Iowa was the number one reason people said that they voted for Trump was that they believed he would make the world safer. And that they that uh, there would be less of these wars. I I thought it was going to be a border issue. I thought it was going to be a 
make food more affordable. And of course, people want those things. But that that uh, that feeling of we're not going to spend trillions of dollars on on wasteful wars uh, and, and make the, the global world on fire and, and unsafe. That that was kind of a shock to me. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, look, every once in a while, um, it, look, national security is always hanging out there in every election, right? It's always a top issue for people, but whether or not they go to vote on it um, is is a little bit more of a jump ball at times. Uh, what's happened over the last two years because of Biden's dreadful mistakes is withdrawal from Afghanistan, that disaster, his weakness that uh, encouraged Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine, um, everything that's going on, again, coddling of Iran, which emboldened them and their proxies, including Hamas and the attack in Israel. Uh, people really do feel as though we're living in a new global disorder. Um, now, I still think that there's a fight going on within the Republican Party over the best way to handle that. Um, uh, and that's part of what you've seen in the debate going on between Donald Trump and, and Nikki Haley. Um, and it's going to be really interesting to me to see how that plays out, because Donald Trump is a curious guy that way. On the one hand, um, he says no more wasteful wars. On the other hand, he still projects himself, though, as a man who will engage strengthfully and forcefully through the world. So it isn't true isolationism. Um, and that, to me, is a little heartening in that I, I still believe a lot of Republicans still believe in peace through strength. And that... Thing that you mentioned out of Iowa, that statistics suggest to me that is the case. Americans want to feel safe and they want a leader who's going to go out and be the world, the guy with the big stick again and say, you know, knock it off, folks. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I know we're I know we're pressed for time. I'm going to put a link to your book, The Biden Malays, down below. Uh, Kim, if people want to follow you and, and stay in the loop, what's the best way for them to do that online? Oh, I'm on Twitter and on Facebook, but Twitter's my favorite place. Um, and then obviously also like the Wall Street Journal, it's a great paper. Um, and uh, I always say to people, you know, you, that that five bucks you spend on a cup of coffee, it's done in two minutes, but you can read the Wall Street Journal all day. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I, I hope you have a great rest of your day.